praise you, Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. God is so good, isn't he? I'm going to say that again, or ask that again. God is so good, isn't he? Amen. God is so good. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. We actually began our study in Daniel last Sunday, uh, and I started off with Daniel chapter 5 uh, because of uh, Halloween that was coming up and everything else, and I just look at Daniel chapter 5 as being an incredible horror story. So, um, you know, I just figured I wanted to share that, being that was right before Halloween. You know, God has, uh, he, he's got something for every occasion, doesn't he? And so now we're going to go and start from the beginning of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, I'm just going to read the first three verses here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you right now, Lord God. We thank you for your word, because your word speaks to us no matter what we are going through, Lord God. Your word is always timely, because it's something that we always need to hear. And so, Father, we pray right now, Lord God, that you would set in our hearts, Lord God, to always serve you. That our purpose, Lord God, in this life would always line up with your will, Lord God. Father, Lord, we pray right now, Lord God, that you would help us take a look at our surroundings, take a look at the conditions that we may be finding ourselves in. If they are hostile, Lord God, you have the ability to see us successfully in those situations. So, Father, we pray right now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch us, that you would speak to us, Lord God, and that by the time everything is said and done, Lord God, may you have revealed yourself to us in a very powerful and real way. Because, Lord God, we always need to hear from you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you see in my title, it's Surviving in Hostile Conditions. The truth is that there can be a lot of hostility all around us. But as you take a look at Daniel and his situation, as we know in ancient times when a people, after losing a war, the victors would carry off the people back into their land. And usually, they didn't take everybody. They only took the nobles at that time, kings' children and things like that, those that were learned. And they left everyone else to work the land that they just occupied. But the other people, they would bring them because they wanted them. They wanted to add them to their collective. It sounds like a, a Star Trek show, doesn't it? You know, the Borg, add them to the collective. Resistance is futile. Not so. But that's hostile conditions. You have to understand that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they are carted off, Daniel... In fact, the other three as well, they're probably no more than 15 to 17 years of age. So much like uh, Joseph was in his day when he, gets, uh, when he gets sold as a slave in Egypt. And these children, teens, are now carried off into a strange land. We don't hear of their parents or anything else. And you talk about being in a hostile environment. So how do you survive in that kind of environment, in a land that you don't know, a language that you're not familiar with, customs that you don't know. Well, you begin to learn them, don't you? You begin to adapt to your surroundings. You begin to learn that culture. You begin to learn their language. You work hard to try to make a difference. 
The problem with all of this is, is that somewhere along the line, so many people started to blend who they were. They lost their identity. It's so easy to lose your identity when you're trying to fit in. And then the thing that's so remarkable about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that they never compromised. They kept high integrity throughout. And so, yes, they did learn the customs. Yes, they were trained. And you think about Daniel, you talk about hostility. You know, Daniel was probably made into a eunuch. He's studying under the eunuchs. Actually, all four of them are. And we're going to get into some other things. So it's not even just being carried off, separated from your home and everything. You talk about being hostility. But you know what? We come in those situations all the time. We may not be carried off as a result of war, but there are transitions, there are things that happen in our lives that put us in places that if we're not careful, we can just blend right in. You know one of the things is a new job. You go to a new job, right? You want to fit in. Who does not like to be liked? Who doesn't want to be liked? I mean, I think we all want that in our lives. I think we want to know that people care what we have to say and things like that. And it's okay to try to fit in and learn the customs and, you know, what's going on in the office, office protocol and things like that. You, you, you get used to all that. Maybe working on shifts and what it takes, learning equipment, whatever it might be. But to compromise who you are. Another area that we see this take place is when our children go off to college. And we can see so many things take place. They go off to college and he come back and say, okay, I know you look a lot like my son, but what did you do with my son? All of a sudden, what happened? Because now, and you know, listen, I understand there can be so many things, and I just want to tell you right now, if you're getting ready to go off to college, you do not have to lose your identity in Christ Jesus. You don't have to do that. You can stay strong for Jesus no matter where you go. I didn't say it's going to be easy, but put yourself in Daniel's place. It wasn't easy for him either. And yet they stood strong for Yahweh. You can too. It doesn't matter where you go, you don't have to compromise. See, the world wants to get in there and try to blend things and blur things. You know, one of the reasons, if you take a look at uh, verse 7, I believe it is in here, Daniel 1, 7, look at this. The chief official gave them new names. You notice I said Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, there's a whole story in that in itself. It's amazing that Daniel, we still know him as Daniel. But the other three, we don't even know their Hebrew names. We only know them by the Babylonian names that there was given to them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's not their Hebrew names. Take a look. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, that's his Hebrew name, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now the thing is, why do you change someone's name? Why wasn't their given name by their parents, their Hebrew names, satisfying? It was a way for them to blend in. It was a way for them to get them to begin to forget their parents, forget their traditions. They're young enough. Daniel, we know, he lives into his 80s. So if he comes in at 15, look at all the years, and yet Daniel doesn't waver. And he could have. He could have taken on all these other names. Remember when we took a look at last week in Daniel chapter 5? Nebuchadnezzar's son sees the writing on the wall, right? All the things take place. Go listen up. But you notice his mother comes in and does not call him by the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave him, but calls him. There's a man, Daniel that knows how to interpret these things. See, he stayed strong throughout. And you can too. It doesn't matter if you go off to college. Yes, there could be new ideas. There could be challenging ideas. That's all well and good. I think we go off to college to be challenged. But to give in? And how many people have given in without even a fight? They just take an assumption that, oh, my parents must have been wrong. Everybody else must be wrong. My church must be wrong. Instead of sitting there and saying, listen, that doesn't sound right. I, I know what's going on here. And I'm just trying to tell you right now, in the difficult times, in the hostile conditions you may find yourself in, you can do more than survive. You can thrive. God has got that. And that's what we want to take a look at today.
You see, what makes a person able to survive in such hostile conditions is not forgetting or replacing their God, but how close they are that they choose to be to their God. That's what will make all the difference in your life. And I hope you hear this, because there could be so many hostile situations you may find yourself in, and you're going to have to make cho choices of whether or not to serve God or to give up on God. To serve God or to be eclectic with all other gods around you. And we've got to be very careful. We're not called to be eclectic in our religion, in Christianity. We're supposed to give God the exclusive rights to our Christianity. Amen? Joshua 24, 15 says this, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then what does he tell? He's talking to the people of Israel. He's now leaving, and you know, he's talking about everything, what they're doing and everything. He say, listen, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, and he tells them, choose another God of the land or something like that. Go ahead. He says, but, for, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's how resolute you have to be in your walk with God. You know, when we take a look at this, Daniel finds himself now 500 years away. What happened? We're only given the fact that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. If that's all you know of the story and the besieging of it, and that they go into, uh, into captivity, you may think that, wow, this was just a war, and there was war going on, and Babylon finally came in and took them. Let me tell you something. No one takes what God won't give. You cannot just take something unless God gives it. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But what happened was, this actually, the fall of Judah goes back to Hezekiah. We forget about this prophecy, don't we? Hezekiah, yeah, that far back. If you take a look at 2 Kings 20, verse 14, this was the defining moment, and it's, it's spelled out clearly. It says in 2 Kings 20, verse 14, then Isaiah, oh, let me just back up here and tell you a little bit of something that's going on. Hezekiah is sick, and God heals him. Babylon, this up-and-coming empire, hears of Hezekiah's illness. So they send a gift to, to him. And obviously, sending the gift meant, they're going to, meant that they're going to be bringing you know, people to deliver the gift. And when they arrive, Hezekiah shows them everything. Isaiah the prophet hears about this. And this is where we pick up. It's like, you know, don't even lie to the prophet of God. You know, just be honest. And Hezekiah was. He said, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? And from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, they came from a far country from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. <laughs> you know, there is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Why would he do that? Obviously, he's not looking at Babylon as a threat right now. He had no idea what they would become. But the reason why he's showing this is because of hubris, pure pride confidence and what is going on and because of this Isaiah says to Hezekiah in verse 16 hear the word of the Lord behold the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon nothing shall be left even the articles in the temple Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and they shall take away some of your sons who, who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be, what, eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So you would think that this would be something that would be very distraught, that Hezekiah would be like, wow, you know what, I blew it big time. Now listen to Hezekiah's response. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which 
you have spoken is good. For he said, will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Wow, how self-serving is that? He could care less about the generations, his own children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren that will come after him. And you know, sometimes we have a tendency to do just like, to, to be like that. To think about ourselves in the now, which is one of the reasons why we can compromise our faith. Don't think about that because you know what? Think about what you will leave your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. They may not even meet you, but you can still leave them a heritage in the Lord, something that will prosper them. The prayers that go up. Have you been praying for your great 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 grandchildren you haven't even seen yet? I think you should. While you have breath, seek them out, pray for them. And consider that what you do today may have consequences. And so that was a defining moment of any defining moment right then and there that Babylon was going to capture Israel. It was over at that point because of that one action, a whole kingdom. Now there was a lot of things that go into it, we know. But as far as a defining moment, that's it. And then we read about this. It says in verse 2, and the Lord gave. He gave Jehoiakim over. Like I said, no one was going to be able to take them away. It was going to have to be God giving them over. God, God gives, does he not? God takes. You see, and this is the one thing that I want you to see, and I want to go over this a little bit here. And there, Actually, this comes up several times in our passage this morning about God giving. You know, the Lord gave. You know, all things belong to God. Amen? All things. You see, God, whatever he created, he still holds the rights to. Everything that has ever been in this planet, in this universe, was created by God. And don't think for a moment he gave the rights over to anybody. Not even the enemy, Satan himself. He doesn't own anything. Nobody owns it. And see, sometimes we forget that when we come into troubling times, because maybe someone who may not see the way we are, someone who may be coming after us, someone who may be attacking us, it'd be so easy to sit there in, in those hostile conditions and, and begin to worry. Let me tell you something. Your God, you stay strong to God. He will give you what you need. It's His. Everything is His. And that's one of the things we have to understand and take a look at. I just want to take a look at that a little bit because I want you to be encouraged this morning. See, God gives promises and makes good on them, doesn't he? If we take a look at Joshua 21, 43, Joshua says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give. God swore he was going to give the promised land to him, and he made good on it. You have to understand, the people that were living there, it wasn't them. It wasn't theirs to give or to take. God says, it's my land. I'm going to give it to whomever I want. Let me tell you something. Walking in faith is a lot like that. It's understanding that wherever you go, that if God drops something in your heart, that you just go, believe, whatever. If it's of God, I'm not just saying make something up. You know, like the name it and claim it thing, you know? That's not what I'm saying. You know what? Whoa, you have a really nice car. I'm going to name that car. I want your car. I'm going to take your car. That's called stealing. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know that. So it has nothing to do with name it and claim it. What it has to do, when you know that God tells you something, even if it doesn't materialize right away, you continue to walk in faith because you know he's going to make good on his promise. That's how we take a look at it. The Israelites, all they ever had to do was to cross over into the promised land and it was going to be given to them. They just had to go in faith, believing that God was going to do that, that he was going to make good on that promise. And so when we come into those hostile conditions, we have got to believe that whatever it is that God has said to us, whatever he dropped them in your heart, in your prayer time, and I know that he has spoken to every Christian in their prayer time. I know it. If you have a prayer time, if you have alone time, God speaks to you. You know that. And in those quiet times when he's speaking, you've got to believe that he's going to make good on that. 
And there is nothing, no matter what the hostility may be around you, that can prevent it. Because it's God's give. He doesn't make a promise and he can't make good on it. Because nobody that owns it. He overthrew the people in the land. In Joshua 21, 44, it says, The Lord gave them rest on every side. You want rest? You want peace? The Lord will give that to you. He says this, just as he had sworn to their forefathers, not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. So who in the world can be against God? Because God will just say, I'm now handing them over to you. And how in the world can they resist it? They can't. If the Lord be for you, who in the world can be against you? See, when God gives, and he comes with this understanding that God owns everything. That he holds the title deed to everything, including your life. In James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Twice given to you will be given. If you ever lacked wisdom, have you asked God yet? Have you believed that he will give it to you? God not just gives wisdom and rest and, 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 and just really destroys the enemies, gives them over to you. He not only just makes good on his promises, but he also gives favor and honor. Listen to this in Psalm 84, verse 11. The Lord bestows or gives favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. God gives those things to you. That's how much he loves you. You know, we don't have to walk in defeatism. We can walk in victory. Why? Because God is on your side. God gives us spiritual authority. In Matthew 10, verse 1, when, he's with it, when Jesus is with his disciples, what does he say? He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority. Who's going to take that authority away? There wasn't one person was going to be able to take that authority away from the disciples because Jesus Christ himself gave it to them. And you know, and God has given you authority. God has blessed you and he gives us things, you know, for, uh, for our mission. And that's something that we have to understand. We're all on mission, amen? And God will equip us, give us things, strategize you know, with us and for us so that our mission will be completed. You know, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 5, God gives us success. Here's King Uzziah. And it says, as long, think about this, as long as he, this is King Uzziah, sought the Lord, God gave him success. And I think that's the key to how much we decide to seek God in our lives. So even if you go into a hostile territory, even if things become hostile around you, you have an understanding that God owns everything. And he gives. He gives freely, especially to those who seek him out constantly. And so that's the question we really need to ask ourselves. It's not how tough the situation is around us how tough everything is around us, but how often do we seek God? That's everything in this, isn't it? He gives. Job understood this. And Job here, in this particular situation, right before I read this verse, you have to understand, Job's children had a party in one of his son's house. All his children are partying in this one house, and a, a, a wind comes out from the desert and tears down the four corners of this house in such a way that it just collapses and Job loses all his children. A servant makes it out of there and comes and tells Job the news that all your kids are gone. And listen to what Job says in, in verse 21, Job 1, 21. He says this, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of of the Lord be praised. And it goes on by saying that Job never sinned by blaming God. Wow, I think that's something we need to hold on to. Because when bad things do happen, how many times have I heard people just blame God for bad things? 
In Job's case, we understand that it wasn't just, just bad things. This wind just doesn't come out of nowhere. It's because the enemy had challenged God and challenged him, and Job was his champion. So we have to be careful. Now here's something that's very interesting, because now we know that Nebuchadnezzar is taking the children. He's the king in charge of Babylon right now. And it's very interesting because here's a verse that comes in and it really challenges us, especially even with an election that's coming up. In Romans 13:1, it says this, everyone must do what? Submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And here's the thing. I imagine in Daniel's day when, all the, when every one of them are now taken away, made eunuchs, and they're now in Babylon serving a foreign king. You know, surely, God, you don't mean for me to submit to this authority. And that can be dangerous. But God said, and we know that this was a result of God because we saw the prophecy spoken of about what is going on there. And there's the fi- defining line right there. To what point do we give authority? How far does that go? How far do we submit? I think really the only thing that we do is when it contradicts God's word. His authority overrides everything. So we cannot adhere to the things that contradict God's word. Outside of that, there's a lot of things that we need to submit to. And here's the interesting thing. If we truly believe that God's the one that, sub- that, that, that God, that there isn't one authority out there in any of any authorities throughout the world that God hasn't put in place, then regardless of what happens, whether you vote for Biden or if you vote for Trump or anyone else in between, think about this, God's gonna have his say. If we truly believe what I just read, it doesn't matter. So if you vote for someone that does not make it in, are you to rebel? Are you not to submit? Again, it goes back to this. You submit up until this is contradicted. That's what it's supposed to be. We're called to a higher calling, are we not? We're called to be Christians. We're not called to, you know, to, to, you know our, our, this is not even our world. Our world, our citizenship is in heaven. And so we submit to God and God alone, number one. And we adhere to everything that he says. It's interesting. Philippians 4, 6 says this. Do not be anxious about anything. So we're coming into this election being anxious. We should not. You may have somebody you want more than someone else, but at the end of the day, God is on the throne. In Proverbs 12, 25, it says this, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Interesting. If you've got a lot of anxiety, it will cause depression because we're giving ourselves over to too many things. There's so many things out there want to divide us, want to separate us from our God, make us doubt what's going on. And at the end of the day, you have to understand there were two major events that God was marching toward all along since the fall. The first event was the birth of his son. Everything marched to that. So from Genesis after the fall, from that moment on, time, history, everything was marching to the birth of Jesus Christ. The second event, everything in this planet is now, after Jesus rose from the grave, everything is now marching toward and setting up Jesus' return, which includes Armageddon. Do you understand what that means? That's why things happen. And you may find yourself in a hostile time frame. Listen, don't let anything divide us together. Don't let anything divide us from who we are. That's what the devil wants to do. We're, we're strong when we are united. We're strong when we stand together. We are strong because I got your back in prayer. You got mine. We can make it. That's what it's all about. And so we may not understand everything. And I guarantee you, none of us have all the facts of everything that is out there. None of us. So what we do is knowing and yielding to God's will always. Because nothing is going to happen on Tuesday 
that God has already allowed. And we may not even know Tuesday, right? <laughs> it could be the end of this month. Who knows? The point is, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious because it is God who gives and it is God that takes. And if you believe what we just talked about, then you'll have peace. You may not like it, and that's okay. But you'll have peace because God is on the throne. You know, they're chosen for service. These four are being chosen for service to work in the high court of Babylon. Yes, I'm changing gears now. And it's interesting because man has his choice. Man chooses, and look at what it says in Daniel. You know, and, and you gotta understand, we're all chosen for service. But the way man chooses and the way God chooses can be quite different. Man's choice for service, we find in Daniel uh, verses 3 and 4. And you think about what it says here. It's, it, they're being told to bring these children. They had to be, you know, they had to be some of the king's descendants, and they had to be noble. So there was a lineage already established. So they had to have, have a strong lineage. You know, they had to have no blemish. So they, they couldn't have anything that would distract you. They couldn't have any, any blemish at all. They had to be handsome. On top of that, they had to be not just good looking, but they had to be gifted. And they had to be quick. They had to have ability and understanding. You know what's missing in this man's choice of what's happening here? What is missing is character. That was never a consideration. Pick somebody who is strong in character and integrity. And you understand then why Daniel was being challenged. Why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be challenged. Because all the people that, were, that had the, the king's ear were corrupt. Their, their, their integrity wasn't there. So this is why Daniel ends up in the lion's den. They became jealous of Daniel. Rather than thanking God for Daniel and thanking that time and time again Daniel saves them, you know, so they're not all killed by interpreting dreams that no one could interpret and things like that. You'd think they'd be happy. Woo, we almost hit the fire ourselves. No, they were jealous. Again, the character wasn't there. But for Daniel, it remained. This is why it doesn't matter the hostile times you may come in. It does not matter. You remain the same. Your character should never deviate from what Scripture says. Amen? Stay strong. You know, character, by the way, I, I, just, I want to give a definition. I believe this is from dictionary.com, and, and, and the same definition is around out there. But I think it's important to understand what we're talking about when we talk about character. It's the aggregate of features. That's the culmination. It's, you know, the aggregate of features and traits that form the individual nature of a person. That's good to understand. In other words, it's every choice you've ever made. It's the aggregate of all of that that makes you who you are. So if you're a person that has time and time again never run away from a fight, they know automatically, well, so-and-so, they'll, they'll, they'll never back down from a fight. They'll see it to the end. That's, how do they know that? Because that's part of your character. You never gave in. If you're someone that lies all the time, lies to get your way and things like that, that becomes a part of your character. And so if you are lying, if it's the aggregate of all these things that make up your character. And people are well, no, I wouldn't trust anything that person says. Have you ever been part of that? That's part of the character. And you can't, you, you can't fool anybody. People know character because it's the summation of who you are. We carry it with us. It is there. So God has a choice for service. And his choice, as we see, is Daniel. Look at what Daniel says here. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. What's going on here? The king puts out that they have to eat these certain foods. And by eating these certain foods is to keep them healthy and everything else. They're supposed to learn their ways for the next three years and then brought, be brought into the king. And he'll decide what goes on after that. And so it's up for the, the eunuch, up to the eunuch that's in charge of them, 
to make sure that they are trained in all these ways and make sure that they are well fed and treated. But Daniel, looking at the food that was provided to them, refused to eat it. You know, you think about that. That's so minuscule, isn't it? It's something they could just go away. Listen, it's food. It's what's being offered. You know, it's the only thing on the menu. He could have just done that. But he set in his heart, and that's what's really going on here. The word purposed here is basically to set. And so basically he set in place, in his heart, he set God in his heart. And because of that, he could not go against what Jews were allowed to eat. It's all lit, written there in Leviticus. And one of those things is an animal that's just strangled with its blood still in. That was a lot. People would eat you know, animals. They wouldn't let their blood drain out. And another thing is probably even more so and more important, with all the many gods that they had, most of the meat was sacrificed to those gods. So we don't have that like it is today where we just sacrifice meat and that's it. You know, we, 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 we kill our meat. We don't necessarily sacrifice it to, to a God, right? At least I hope we don't. But here's the thing. His integrity is saying, I'm not going to do that. And I don't know whatever goes on maybe in your life. Maybe there are situations that come, about, come by or come around and you're sitting there saying, well, you know what? Should I or should I not do this? What does the Word of God say? And it doesn't matter how minuscule it might be, you know, because we got to be careful when we think about this. Because all the things of character, you know, it's found in the details of our lives. It really is. In the smallest of details. In the smallest of compromises and no compromises that makes up who we are. So stay strong regardless of what is going on and the hostility around you. He said, when it comes to it, what is in your heart? In 2 Chronicles 12, 13 to 14, listen to what it says about King Rehoboam. It says that King Rehoboam did evil. But why did he do evil? Because he had not set in his heart on seeking the Lord. You understand how important that is then? Right now, if you're going to make good decisions... It's in the good times that you set things in your heart it, so that you can, in the bad times, be able to carry that over. And I'm not saying these are good times. I'm talking about regardless of where you are at in your life, stay strong to Him no matter what. No matter how bad things get, no matter how good they may get, you will always be able to serve Him. Why? Because you're considering Him in all your ways. In all your ways. Amen? And I like this. Again, in Daniel chapter 1, 9, it says this, Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. Because Daniel made this in his, in his heart, God gave him favor with those who were immediately in, in control. You begin to see how things begin to happen. You see, if you're having problems with somebody at work, this is why we're called to pray for people. Even people that... That, that have caused us harm and maybe we don't have feelings for them who cares if you got feelings we got to be obedient obedience overrides feelings every single day and so what we do is we take a look at this and we say you know what I may not like that person because what that person may have done to me but you know what I'm going to do I'm going to begin to pray for that person because I'm called to pray for that person. And we begin to pray and begin to believe that God's going to do something there. You do think that Daniel did not pray for the moment all the way over? I believe he, you know, he just leaned on God more than ever before. And it's interesting, because of Daniel's example, the other three follow suit. Daniel set a trend, and I have to say something right now. You know, parents... You know, one thing that was missing as well that we have here, we're not told of Daniel's parents, but let me tell you something. At 15 years old to 17, somewhere around in there, it's because he was trained to observe God. Let me tell you something, parents, don't give up. You may have the next Daniel on your hands. You may have somebody, you know, that may be just like that in your life. You know, in your children, raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And even if they're ripped from you, even if they're taken from you, you know that if you never see them again, and we have no evidence that Daniel ever saw his parents again, you know, we have no, no idea if he ever saw them. But it doesn't matter. They knew who he was when he left. They knew that they trained him. 
And they believed on the promises that when you train a child in the way that he should go, he will what? Not part from it. They held on to that promise. It's because there was godly parents. You gotta remember, they were taken from Judah. This was now the southern kingdom that fell. And there was a lot of good examples in Judah. But none ever more important than parents. It's good to have people that we can look up to. It's good to have people, I mean, I, I looked up to Billy Graham. I, th I thought, what an awesome guy. You know, someone who did it right, I always felt. It doesn't mean he did it perfect. There's a difference. No one is perfect but Jesus. But nothing is more important or can take the place of being trained right from home. Parents, grandparents, you have an obligation to train, to teach, to pass on your experiences, to pass on what God has done for you in such a way that they take hold of it. And if you do that, you'll have someone like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, people that will not bend when the enemy comes in and tries to destroy them. And in doing so, you give them an incredible, precious gift, Jesus Christ. So we end our story as it comes down. If you take a look at verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding. Again, here is God giving. God gives. It says, he gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. So you know what's going on? They're all in competition with all the other children that have been taken, not just from Israel or Judah, but from all of the nations that Babylon was conquering. And so now they're like in a competition, and the king is going to take a look at them and decide. And God gives them this kind of wisdom and understanding, so much so that they would increase and stand out above everybody else. Listen to what it says. And Daniel could understand, not only did he have knowledge and understanding, but Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. In verse 19 it says, the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Look at this. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. It's because while they're learning about the ways and everything else there, they never lost their way in Christ. Well, in them, it was Yahweh, right? But how much so is that true of us? Jesus tells us that we're not of this world. In fact, he even prays that God will not take us out of the world. Hey, why? Because we're supposed to be in it. We are to learn. And there's a lot of good people that we can learn things from. Not everything is evil. The trappings come when those who are not born of this world want to be of the world. Like that's the way to fit in. No. You're not of this world, and God hasn't called you out of the world so you can be an example to the world and bring them to where you are. Listen, the higher you go, you know this, the higher you go in, in, in business, if there's someone that can supplant you, they'll try to supplant you. If you're a CEO of a company, there's always going to be somebody to try to take your position because they may want what you got. There's always going to be somebody that's going to try to undermine or try to take what you've got. We just live amongst that. But we don't give in to their ways and we don't respond because we represent heaven. And I don't know what you may be going through. I don't know the anxieties you may have in your heart. But I do know the answer and that is Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. And he has given everything to you. Seek him. Maybe right now as you look at this, maybe you're filled with anxiety. 
Maybe because of the election, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of maybe something else. Maybe you're fearful of losing a job and it's got you all like tightly wound and everything else. You know that. We live in situations and problems around the world. Give it over to Jesus. You don't have to be anxious about anything because there isn't anything that God is not in control of. So I'm going to ask right now, if you would, if you would bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings in our lives. You have given to us so many things, and the greatest gift you've ever given us is Jesus Christ, who died and paid for our sins, that when we accept him, we know that the guilt will be removed, that we have forgiveness from all sins, and then we have the gift of eternal life. And so, Father, we pray right now, Lord God, that you would speak to each and every person within the sound of my voice, whether they're here in the sanctuary or at home watching. Lord God, you see what we may be going through, and you see the anxiety, you see how the devil tries to get in there and, and really cause all kind of havoc. But Father, we rebuke that. We're not going to allow him to cause division in our homes. A division between us and you. A division in our church. A division in whatever it might be. We will not allow that to be. Never allow that to take place.